I just want to say, first off, I do want to dedicate this class to someone who recently had passed away from the office in New Jersey, Jerry Pineson. Some of you know him, some don't. But he was a tireless organizer, committed himself to the revolution in the field, and also did a lot to bring what were a con continued to be a youth movement around the New Jersey office. So it's like to dedicate the class to him, and uh, you know our thoughts are with him. Now, what I want to go through is is to pose the question: What is the shape of space? And to pose that as the challenge of tuning the universe for mankind. That that really is the challenge before us now. And it seems like a funny question to many people, the shape of space. Because the idea we have of space, so-called, tends to be something which is absolutely shapeless. Infinitely extended in three directions, no structure to it. It's empty. Right? So we're led to believe. Now, to start to get at that question, um, I just want to start with a couple of, of quick images that sort of set it up, and then we'll go into what this means for the work we're doing now, both on massive infrastructure projects and then some of the forefronts of science. So here we've got what might look like the inside of Geithner or Obama's head. Had a big empty dome. But it's structured. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the key. But in fact, what we're looking at here is the chapel at Pazzi in Florence. And this is something that was constructed by Brunelleschi in the middle of the 15th century. And it's, it's very well known for a number of reasons. One, it employs very well-organized harmonic principles of geometry, uh, mostly circle, square, and certain very um, distinct proportions between the two. Now, what it's also known for, and this is something which Mr. LaRouche has pointed out on several occasions, is that it's, in fact, tuned to the human singing voice. That were you to sing in this chapel, in this dome, as he said, it sings back to you. That it's been organized to enhance the beautiful singing of a well-trained bel canto human voice. So here we have a certain material idea of a organizing of space. That the space has been organized to promote the beautiful singing of man to promote the uplifting of the human soul. And it was done according to certain discovery of certain fundamental principles both in geometry, but then fundamental principles in harmonics and acoustics. Now here's another construction that was designed also by Brunelleschi in the middle of the 15th century. This is the dome in Florence, uh, Santa Maria del Fiore. And this is something unique because this, again, was based off of a discovery of a certain characteristic of the shape of space, so to speak, and then utilizing the discovery of some underlying characteristic to the shape of space to construct something which was otherwise impossible. And there's a whole story behind this that I'm not going to go into now, but we've written a lot about it within our movement, and you can look into it, but the construction itself a dome that size, which at the time was the largest in the world, and to be done without the kind of buttressing which typically was used for building these kinds of structures, was in effect an impossible task at the time. But it was accomplished because Brunelleschi had discovered a certain characteristic principle about the shape of space, so to speak. And what he, what he utilized in order to build this thing so that you could build it and it would support itself as it was being built. Because it, they didn't have, there were certain problems where the wood wasn't available in Florence to use, the, to create the kind of buttressing to hold it up as it was being built. So he had to discover a new principle to enable him to build this thing so that it would be self-supportive as it was being constructed. And he did it based off of a unique curve 
what's known as the catenary curve. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bent, but it's effectively the curve that's created. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. By hanging a chain from two fixed points. Now, it seems fairly simple, but the curve itself has certain unique properties to it. Um, we've often discussed it as being a kind of least action type of curve. But the general thing is that it minimizes the amount of tension on both sides. And it's a curve which is not generated by some sort of abstract mathematical or geometric principles. It's a curve which exists in space. It's a curve which is generated as a function of the harmonic characteristics and the shape of the space in which the chain is hanging. And so utilizing certain characteristics of this catenary curve, the way it distributes weight and um, the minimizing principle involved, this was utilized then by Brunelleschi to be able to construct this massive dome in such a way that it didn't collapse on itself as it was being built up. So there again, it was a it was mankind discovering some sort of hidden principle about the governing and underlying characteristics and shape of the space to then construct this massive, beautiful dome whose sole purpose is to then further uplift and develop the mind of man, to stretch the imagination of man through this kind of construction. So I just wanted to put this out here initially. To, that's the kind of thing to have in your mind as we start to move into a discussion of what do we mean by what is the shape of space and by taking on the challenge of tuning the universe to the benefit of man. So we've got a certain idea, hopefully people are starting to get a certain idea of what we mean by shaping the space around us. You know, what is discovering what is the shape of that space and then what does it mean to change the space which we operate in. Thus far what I've discussed has been largely, or what sort of probably pops into your imagination in discussing these projects, is largely probably the material and what we might consider the, the uh, chemical material aspect of what the transformation would be. The flow of water, the movement of steel, mining, building things. Right? You're sort of building up sort of the material physical side of the planet. But that's in fact only a very thin slice of what we're actually getting at here. Largely what people have in their mind when they think about the kind of transformations which are implied through this kind of policy, the effects, are largely effects which they image in terms of how they've thus far interpreted the world based off their immediate five senses. Right? How things look when I see them with my eyes. How things feel and touch. But that's not the whole picture. There's a whole domain of reality, a whole spectrum of activity and effects which exist in this universe which are not immediately accessible to our five senses, which we don't just see with vision, which we don't just hear with our ears, which we can't sense based off of touch, and which the models which we construct based off of those senses, based off of a certain geometric and mathematical constructions, which are derived from our interpretation of the world based off of those senses don't give you the whole picture of what's actually out there. That what we tend to you know, understand about or represent the world as in terms of our vision, for example, you know, is only a very small fraction of what we can consider as the electromagnetic spectrum which pervades the entire universe. So when we think about trains, when we think about 
building projects, when we think about changing weather systems, when we think about directing flows of water, in our minds, the image that we conjure is largely limited to images associated with this very narrow band of reality. But as we can see, there's an entire spectrum of action, of effects, which are far beyond anything which we can sense. You know, maybe we can sort of, we can sense some of the, the infrared through heat and sensation like that. Um, we've got vision. There's some question about what, in what range are uh, audible effects, right? We've, had, we've looked at a little bit where there's certain audible effects associated with the microwave range. But still, that's very limited. It's a very limited um, image, view of what actually exists. So this is what I want to take up now is let's start to think about what kind of transformations we're going to be discussing, what kind of transformations are going to come about through these types of projects. But let's look at it, at least start to look at it, in a much wider domain of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so that's what we're going to get into a little bit now. This is an image of four different images of what's known as the Crab Nebula. And it's not that, it's just the, it's a poor image on the computer. But these are four different, four different telescopes which are equipped with different types of instrumentation, which read different aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then, of course, one of the limiting capacities of mankind right now is that we then have to translate those other domains of the electromagnetic spectrum into a visible uh, translation, a visible projection. So obviously, so here's sort of an optical um, image of the Crab Nebula, which was discovered in, uh, was it 1054, uh, B, uh, yeah, 1054 AD uh, by some Chinese astronomers. And this is, I mean, you look it up, they'll say a, a nebula is the remnant of an exploded star. But I think that's a completely backwards idea of what these things are because the kind of things that emerge out of what's supposed to be an exploded star is actually a very organized, structured process, which I think is much more equivalent to something like a, a birthing process. It's more of, instead of an exploded star, I mean, you can think of a sort of a hatching of an egg or something, which is, much, I think, much more appropriate to the reality of what's occurring. So this is an optical image of the Crab Nebula. Here is an X-ray image, and this is the X-ray will tend to capture what's known as the, the pulsar of it, which is a, a, um, there's a central, and this is again, this is all sort of speculation, but a central neutron star, and so the X-ray image is this. Obviously, it looks a lot different than the optical image. Then you've got the infrared, and then you've got the emissions as read through radio signal. So this is just to give you an idea that you know, what we see in the domain of the optical is just a slice of what are the potential characteristics and realities of a phenomena such as the Crab Nebula or, or various nebula. They all look very different. So this is what we want to start to get at. What does the world look like around us? What kind of transformations will be created as viewed in these other domains? You know, what is really the shape of the space we exist in when we start to look at it in terms of the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic scale? All right, so what you're looking at here is these are, um, this is just an animation of the different flows of, of ocean currents on the planet. And I'll make a point about that in a second. So here you just see, this is just depicted, I think this was put together by NASA but it just depicts the flow of currents in the ocean. And as people know, you know, the water in the ocean doesn't just sit there. It's constantly flowing and there's very definite um, flows that it has, certain directions it has. And this is basically you're getting the warmer waters flowing up north as it cools, it sinks, and goes down. And it's a lot of this kind of the circulation typically is thought of as generated through different changes in temperature, pressure, and so you get this circulating process of water around the globe. 
Now, what's not depicted here is the fact that there's a whole electromagnetic component to this process that, as people know, we have a magnetic field on the planet. Two poles, North Pole, South Pole, and people have probably seen some of the images of the, the magnetic field lines that go around the planet. Now, as this water moves, again, this is salt water. So what you get with salt diluted or dissolved in water is you get, it's not simply just sodium chloride, so to speak, in water. But what happens is that it, it breaks down into sodium and chloride ions, positive and negative ions. So as these, the flow of the water, of the positive and negative ions, move through the magnetic field of the Earth, they get sort of sent in two different directions, and you get the generation of electric currents in the oceans. Now, they're very small currents, but nonetheless, they are measurable. And as we'll see later, it's actually often the very small, fine um, forces which have the greatest effect. So we're on one level, we see, okay, we see water moving. What's actually also happening and is coupled to this is that that movement of water through the magnetic field, which again is not something we can see. Right? If you have a compass, you sort of see that the compass needle moves as you move, seemingly through some invisible force. Right? To the first people who discovered this, it must have seemed like some sort of magic. You know, why is this thing moving seemingly always orienting in some direction by some force which I have no comprehension of. But that you know, gives an idea of what's sort of the deeper structure of the kind of world we live in. So anyway, so as the, the water, the salty water, which is then full of these, these ions, these positive and negatively charged ions, are moving through the magnetic field, the magnetic field is then moving the positive and negative ions in separate directions. The movement of charge is then creating a secondary magnetic field. So what you're getting is you're getting this coupling of both the magnetic, the geomagnetic field of the Earth, coupled with this created secondary magnetic field, which is generated by the electric currents, which are created by the flow of salt water through the geomagnetic field. And so you've got this whole other domain of change which is occurring which is not something which is immediately accessible to our senses, but which is having very dramatic effects on the planet. Now think about this, and I've actually discussed this before in a, in a, in a video, which is also on our website. When we talk about this NAWAPA operation again, we're talking about moving 20% of the water, which typically flows out of out of Alaska into the ocean, Pacific and Atlantic Ocean. 20% of the water which flows there a year, we're going to be diverting down through this NAWAPA project. That has a couple effects to it. One, it's actually going to increase the salinity level of the water up in that area. Because this is all fresh water which is flowing off of the mountains into the oceans there. So by diverting a certain portion of it away, that's going to decrease the amount of fresh water going into that area, and thereby is going to increase the overall salinity level of the oceans in that particular part of the globe. What effect might that have? Now, if you look at what sort of determines, say, the strength of the electric fields that are generated by the flow of salt water through the geomagnetic field, there are three components which determine the amount of charge that results from the flow of, of salt water through the geomagnetic field. One is obviously the salinity level. Two is the temperature. And three is the pressure. So changes in any one of those three things, salinity level, temperature, or pressure, are going to change the amount of conducted current that's going to be generated. So, by diverting the flow and changing the flow of the fresh water into this area, in some subtle way, we will be changing the actual 
electromagnetic characteristic of what's going on in that part of the planet. What effects is that going to have? That's something we need to investigate. But it's something which otherwise would not be immediate as a question to us did we not open up our minds to this broader domain of, of change. So that's one thing we need to look at. And it'll become clear why things of that subtle nature become so important um, as we get a little bit further. Now the other aspect of this is, as I said, by changing the flow of water around the planet, we're going to be changing weather systems. We're going to be changing weather patterns. This is something which connects very interestingly to our own, the, own, the history of evolution of life on our planet, in fact. That here what you've got is a, a map. So it's a map of the world, and this is a, um, it depicts the occurrence of thunderstorms. Now as you can see, you know, red being more and going down to very light green, which is near zero. So the bulk of the thunderstorms occur over the continents, obviously. Um, and also areas which are, you know, tend to be wetter, more tropical areas, which makes sense. But there's an implication to this. First, there's a certain evolutionary implication to this, which is the fact that people are probably aware that prior to about, I want to say, 400 million years ago or so, there was very little amount of life on land. The, the land masses were dry. They were dead. All life originated and was in the oceans. Now, at a certain point, life started to creep ever more and more onto the continents. Continents which were, as I said, dead, dry, not a lot going on there. Over the course of hundreds of millions of years, life completely took over and dominated the continents with the kinds of forests that we're familiar with and life forms we're familiar with today. Now, it was in doing that that this kind of process was created. You would not have thunderstorms, particularly of this density and this quality, over the continents were it not for life. This is fully an effect of life moving onto land. So, one effect is then by changing certain kind of weather patterns, we're going to be affecting, say, the location and density of these kinds of storms, affecting certain changes in the storms. I mean, one thing worth pointing out, and we've done some reports on this, is that, you know, for example, many of the hurricanes, which have been so devastating to the United States, actually have their origin in northern Africa, where because of the, the trade winds and then the kicking up of dust and other things, that's what actually kicks these hurricanes into formation, which then make their way across the Atlantic and have had devastating effects on North America. Now, you start to um, bring water. You start to irrigate. You start to green the deserts of Africa. We may potentially be able to quell all those destructive hurricanes because you'll no longer have the kind of hot winds, the kicking up of dust, and, you know, it's another example of the managing of the biosphere for the benefit of both life as a whole on the planet and most specifically to the benefit of creative developing mankind. So by doing some of these changes, we're going to be changing some of the, the weather patterns and the storm systems. Here is a um, similar thing, basically tells the same story but this depicts the um, intensity of lightning. So you see, you know, the darker red, black, this is where you have more intense lightning storms. So again, this is occurring largely over land, predominantly over land, and the amount, the intensity, these are the kinds of things which potentially could be changed through this extended Nawapa project. Now obviously, okay, we're talking about lightning here, what other effects does that have? One of the effects of lightning is the creation of charging what are known as Schumann resonances. 
Now here, so, you know, I'll explain a little bit more. But what you're seeing here is that this is effectively a standing wave of very extremely low frequency electromagnetic radiation, which is a standing wave which is in effect pulsing around the globe, but which is charged by the lightning strikes. And I'll, uh, go, I'll go into a little more detail on that once this thing plays through. Anyway, so what was discovered by this guy Schumann, who was a German scientist in the, uh, I think he died in the 1960s, but he, he was out of um, Jena, I think, initially, in Germany. He discovered that there was what's known as extremely low frequency electromagnetic waves, which were ever present on the planet. And these were in the frequencies he's measured from sort of the, the, the peak frequency. So anyways, these are the, this says 7.83 hertz, 14 hertz, I think that's 21, 26, 33. Okay, so these are the peak frequencies of what he discovered as these standing waves of extremely low frequency electromagnetic radiation. So these things are effectively pulsing around the Earth. So you can see the fundamental frequency of 7.83 hertz. That's this brown one which goes around, it touches once, and then you can see sort of the harmonics of it, which are based off of a couple of things. The way he determined what the frequency should be was based off of, one, the circumference of the Earth, and then the speed of light, about 80% the speed of light, because it was dampened by certain absorption effects and other things. So based off of that, based off of the size of the Earth, and then the damping effect of the speed of light, he was able to come fairly close to what we now measure as a more accurate 7.83 hertz. And then you get different harmonics of this, where you get, which are based off of effectively equal divisions of the circle, and then you know, the, the speed of light. So basically what you've got is you've got the Earth, and then around the Earth you've got what we call the ionosphere. People are familiar with that. That's a, a layer of the upper atmosphere, which is created through the interaction of, of, uh, of molecules, our atmosphere, gas molecules of our atmosphere, with solar and cosmic radiation. So the interface between the gassed out atmosphere and cosmic radiation and solar radiation is the creation of what's known as the ionosphere, which is a, a band of ionized gases, um, charged electron particles, and acts as a kind of shield. And it's actually what we use for things like um, radio transmission. Right? We bounce the radio waves off of, off of the atmosphere, and that's how we send these things around the globe. So what he found was that you have this elect very low frequency, you know, 7 hertz. That means it's going through 7 cycles per second, you know, versus things like... Uh, you know, I think radio waves are upwards of hundreds of thousands of hertz, if I'm not mistaken. So this is very low frequency um, electromagnetic radiation. Now what he also hypothesized and what we've discovered to be true is the thing that charges this, that keeps this maintained, is lightning. It's through the strikes of lightning, which themselves are then sending out a certain amount of low extremely low frequency electromagnetic radiation in addition to what we sort of witness as the very high energy electricity strikes are the thing that keep this thing fed. You didn't have any lightning. If there was no lightning on the planet, you wouldn't have these Schumann resonances. So what you've got is you've got this constantly standing pulsing wave which is operating at these various frequencies, 7.83 hertz, 14.1 hertz, 20.3 hertz. So one, by changing the characteristics of, say, thunderstorms and other aspects of the electromagnetic environment, we may be changing or altering or enhancing aspects of the Schumann resonances. Now, what's so unique about these Schumann resonances or these particular frequencies? Well, for one, they just happen to correspond with the principal brainwave activity of mammalian brains and human brains in particular. That the peak frequency, the fundamental frequency of the Schumann resonance, 
lies between is, you know, usually it's, some of these, they differ a little bit, but usually between the theta and alpha range, this one depicts it right at the sort of the top of the theta range. Now this is, you know, this is what generated through, people have heard of EEG readings, where they measure the change in um, electric potential of, of the brain, which is sort of the background or standing frequency, the oscillating frequency of the electrical activity of the brain, at least, you know, a healthy living brain. So there's something unique here that, in effect, you can look at it a couple different ways. One, these Schumann resonances are of the same frequency as the actual activity of the human brain. The frequencies themselves, the Schumann resonances themselves, came about because of a certain process of evolutionary development. Life moves out of the seas onto land. The land becomes abundant with life. That then facilitates the development of storm systems. The storm systems and the lightning then create and charge the atmosphere and create these Schumann resonances around the globe. It's then within that background of electromagnetic environment of Schumann resonances, which then the mammalian brain, and in particular the human brain, actually develop to be in effect incoherence with. So the actual activity of the human brain is organized to be coherent in its electromagnetic characteristics with the resonating electromagnetic environment of our planet as a whole. There's a lot of interesting things that we can, you know, we can hypothesize about this. Now, it's not to say that thought or that creativity is an electromagnetic phenomena, but obviously the substrate upon which the creative mind depends is of an electromagnetic quality and is very much tuned into the electromagnetic environment of the planet as a whole. So certain questions come up. As we change things like the Schumann resonances, either by enhancing them, maybe strengthening them, changing them, who knows, through the kind of development projects we're, we're proposing, what kind of effects might that have then on brain activity? Maybe it enhances it. Maybe it's deleterious to it. We'd have to you know, figure out how to adjust to meet those kinds of changes. But they're very real changes which we're going to have to take into account. Now, there's, I have different hypotheses about some of what sort of is implied by this. Um, I mean, I can just throw out one. It's sort of, you know, wilder, but the range that the fundamental frequency of the Schumann resonance is at, which is the 7.83, is right around the range, which is typically what we think of as that zone right before you fall asleep, which if you read people like Edgar Allan Poe and others, is sort of the domain where you tend to have a little more of a, a lucid sort of quality of thought, right? a little more free play, you know, something which uh, someone who Lynn used to emphasize a lot, um, Lawrence Kuby, he talks about the, the pre-conscious, which is the domain where the images or the sort of symbols, in his, this is his terminology, the symbols and whatnot which we are more explicit in the conscious, language, symbols, images, whatnot, in the domain of the pre-conscious are a little more free to sort of float around, overlap, and intermingle. And he discusses this as kind of where a lot of more uh, creative thought or intuitive thought comes from, where you're a little more free to make connections among things which otherwise might not have been as obvious to you. You know, he talks about this is where things like new machinery comes out of, where you're sort of combining different types of processes in new ways, which then the result of the combination is greater than the pieces themselves, right? Result in some new fundamental principle of change or some new kind of action which is possible through this interplay. So, I'm just saying maybe the, there's a relationship between that sort of domain where you get more of a free interplay or where the sort of the substrate of cognition is in fact tuned to some of the resonating characteristics of our planet. What exactly that can mean, I don't know, that's up for interpretation, but it's something I think 
I'd like to continue to investigate of, you know, in fact, maybe the electromagnetic characteristics of the planet had evolved and developed to facilitate then the, the substrate of brain to then be sort of most conducive to then the mind's utilization of that substrate for creative thought. So, and that's part of, you know, what's been the sort of the big question in science of what is the, the mind-brain relationship. Obviously, the mind is not the brain, but if you lose your brain, you have a very tough time having self-conscious creative thought. Now, you know, the greatest, you know, and then part of the challenge, as Lynn keeps posing and the greatest scientists and thinkers of the past have posed is, in effect, how do you sort of, while you've got a brain, develop your creative potential such that after the brain and the substrate is gone, the creative effect of your living continues to reverberate and act in the universe? You know, the way someone like Plato is still able to, through the mediated relationship of other human beings, act in the universe in a very real, living way today. Even though his particular substrate has since dissipated, his mind still is very active. So anyway, so these are some of, this is some of the questions that which come about when we start to think about changing the electromagnetic environment and the relationship of life to the electromagnetic environment. Now just to pose a couple other things that are along these lines. Um, one of the students of Schumann, this guy Koenig, he was the first one actually to discover that there was a relationship between the EEG activity of the brain and these resonances. Now he then started to do experiments on well, what kind of effects do changes in the background um, extremely low frequency have on just human activity. Now obviously there's a certain limit in the kind of experiments you can do and you know some of it was fairly simple but one thing that he discovered was that he basically started, they set up some tests at this, uh, some kind of fair or something in Germany. And they, I forget the exact condition, they created a certain condition where they were, they had a induced um, electromagnetic field, oscillating electromagnetic field in different ranges. And then these, the people there would go through certain, they were basically playing games. And they were just, they didn't, I don't think they knew that there was, this changing electromagnetic field occurring. So they're playing these different kind of games at this fair. Now what he, what he discovered out of this, the effects were that whenever the oscillating electromagnetic field that was being induced that they were operating in was around three hertz, they had a much lower reaction time. The games they were playing on average were much lower. Their reaction time was less. I mean their reaction time was higher, they, they were slower at these games. Whenever, it was, whenever he then tuned it to 10 hertz, their reaction time went down. In other words, they are faster. The time it took for them to react to things was much less. And so he was sort of looking at this, and then there was other effects they looked at. People would complain of headaches whenever different tunings were there, and there's a lot of subtle effects. Uh, astronauts have reported some of these effects too. Yeah, yeah, like physical game, like they're because they're at a carnivore, some kind of fair. Okay. They're doing like you know, like jousting games, like other kind of <laughs> weird stuff. Um, not that it was during that period, but that you know, at these carnivals, it's like a Renaissance fair or something. So, anyways, yeah. So he was looking at what's the reaction time of these people under different oscillating fields, and he found that there's a very definite discrepancy. Depending on what oscillating field was operating, you got very different reaction times. You know, that implies different things. I mean, one, it also implies, well, maybe through these kinds of um, global changes in the electromagnetic environment, we can start to think about, well, how do you change the entire electromagnetic environment to enhance human activity, to make people maybe a little more agile, I mean, and this is just one thing. Who knows? There's a whole range of different kinds of just biological responses that you can tune to the effect of creating healthier, better functioning human beings. These are the kind of things we have to take into account. I'll mention just one other study which 
is particularly relevant to the Schumann resonances in particular. And these are the studies of a guy named um, Dr. Luc Montagnier, who uh, people familiar with our website have seen. Um, first, there was a, a kind of a presentation with animations presented by um, Ouyang Tang and Larry Hecht. And then we also did a long interview with Dr. Luc Montagnier, which recently went up. He, for people who don't know, he was a Nobel Prize winner, and he had discovered the HIV virus. Now, recently, he started doing work in looking at, basically, the domain he's called, he's called it wave biology. And he started to look at different bacteria, or DNA strands, and started noticing that you could take, these, you could take a certain solution, which had some, some DNA in it, um, mostly initially from bacteria, and you could start to um, dilute it further and further and further to the point where it was diluted so much that you could no longer detect any of the material DNA in there. There was no particle detection at all. All you really had was this water, was the water dilute solution. But yet, from the dilute solution, they were still picking up an electromagnetic frequency. So there was a frequency emanating from this extremely diluted solution to where there was no material responsible for this. Now, he postulated that this was an effect of what's come to be known as a structured water phenomena. And this is something which um, another guy we've, we've started to work with, um, his name's uh, Pollock, is his last name. He's done a lot of work on what's called structured water, which is the idea that water under particularly thi very thin films of water, like, uh, you know, the kind of, that would stick to a surface, becomes structured and actually polarized and has very different characteristics in just bulk water. Um, one, it's a, a strong absorber of UV radiation. Um, it's, uh, it has a certain strength to it, a certain structure to it, so that it can actually, you can, you know, it does different experiments so you can support certain kinds of heavier weights and things on this structured water. But it has all kind of different freezing point, different boiling point. It's completely different than, you know, it's more, it has more of like a lattice type, a crystal lattice type quality to it, even though it's still flexible and still has certain qualities of a fluid. It's completely different than your typical water. So part of what Montagnier's hypothesis is that somehow the water is then being structured by the initial, the initial, um, the initial, the fact that you initially had some DNA in the water, that that DNA itself is sort of is radiating a certain electromagnetic field. That field is then organizing the water such that as you then remove the material, the DNA material, the structure is still held within the water. The water still has a certain structure and a certain resonating quality that was induced in it by the DNA. So what he did is he then set up an experiment which is very interesting. Um, you now, to sort of draw this here, just simplistically. Can you see that, Art? Oh, sorry. Can you see that? Okay. So, if this was just your initial, this is your dilute solution here. And it's got, and it's uh, sending out this. electromagnetic frequency. I think the frequency you measure was in around the, I want to say a thousand hertz range. Thousand, three thousand, I might be up to check, but I think it was around that. So this is a very dilute solution. There's no longer any detectable particles or anything, or any physical material DNA in here, but yet it's emanating this electromagnetic uh, field. <coughs> now what he did is he then set up another beaker next to it, which had nothing in it but pure water, as pure as he could get. I mean, you know, nothing's completely pure, as we all know, but as pure as he could get it. What he then did was that he had to set up a, he then put this in a, a, a coil, You know, wire coil. It's hooked up to some sort of battery. 
and created, through running a, a charge through this thing, created a, a magnetic field, a background magnetic field. Now, the magnetic field that he generated, the frequency, and he played around with a bunch of different ones, the one he finally settled on, and I'll get to the point of that, was roughly 7 hertz. And he himself draws the parallel to the fact that this is in the range of the Schumann resonances. So he creates a background field of 7 hertz. Then what he does is he starts to put certain materials, basic materials, into this solution here into the pure water. Um, nucleotides, certain fundamental um, biological materials. Now what happened, and this was the very, this was the, you know, sort of the lady popped out of the cake on this one, <laughs> was that the material under this condition actually organized itself into the same DNA strands, which were initially the ones responsible for creating the electromagnetic field in the dilute water. Now, it's like, you know, a virtual impossibility that this could be a random thing. I mean, it was the exact same sequencing of DNA chain of the original DNA that was used to, that was diluted down to produce this field. So what was happening, in effect, was that this was creating an organization of the space in this water such that the material in there was brought into coherence, was brought to conform to the original structure that produced the electromagnetic field. The other side to it was it only occurred when you had this background 7 hertz background field. Mm -hmm. If you tried to do this with a different frequency or without any kind of background frequency, you didn't get this transformation. And so there's a very clear relationship between the background 7 hertz frequency in combination, intersecting, sort of harmonizing with the, the 1,000 or so hertz electromagnetic frequency from the dilute solution, which then was responsible for shaping, in effect, shaping the space such that these things came into form of a very specific type. Possibly. Yeah, I mean, it implies all kinds of things, that there's some, that much of what we sort of take for granted or just look at on a very simplistic level, on a material sort of molecular level, is very much interconnected and dependent on a whole entire spectrum of electromagnetic radiation and of, and of an electromagnetic space <coughs> for these things to occur. Um, that's sort of make a couple more quick points just to sort of show a little more of how this kind of works. Um, let's talk about the work of a guy named uh, Robert Becker. He wrote this book called Body Electric, and he sort of reviews a lot of different um, studies in this direction. One of the, where he got started was he initially was looking at, uh, for example, the electric potentials that exist with uh, things like salamanders. You know, he was measuring these DC currents in salamanders. And he found that at the limbs, you tend to have a negative um, charge. And then along the central points of the nervous system, you have a positive charge. You have a certain, you have a flow. You have a DC current flow in these things. Now, as a lot of people know, salamanders are able to regenerate their limbs. Now, people know about the tail thing. But also, if you cut off a limb, over time, it will regenerate that limb. What he found was that the, the cut, when these things were amputated, had a very strong charge to it, a very strong negative charge to it. And then this thing would develop. Now, it sort of got back to one of the more fundamental questions in biology, which is how do cells, you know, when an egg is developing and the cells are splitting, how do these cells know what to become? Right? How does a cell know to become a finger cell as opposed to a heart cell? or a hair cell, or anything. Because initially, the cells are all the same. And every cell, supposedly, through the DNA, has sort of the encoding, and there's a lot of problems with that, of the entire structure. But yet, for whatever reason, based on its location, a cell becomes a particular type as opposed to another. An initially undifferentiated cell is differentiating. So it became a big question. Well, what's organizing 
the development of a living process. Why does something become a salamander as opposed to a human being? Why does it become a foot as opposed to a head? So his idea was there must be something about the way that the, the current is able to induce a certain differentiation and that there must be some broader biological field which is organizing this. And this gets back to the work of people like uh, Alexander Gervich, who was the first one to show that cell mitosis, division of cells, is organized and triggered by the emission from one cell to another of uh, biophotons, which is um, radiation in the UV range, which is what stimulates and drives the multiplication process of cells. But that that's coordinated by what he called a biological field. Now, he was, I like his approach because he, he never wanted to reduce the biological field to simply an electromagnetic field or something. But he left open that there might be a whole other quality of field potential in the universe which is exclusive to life, which might be coupled and might have electromagnetic characteristics, but which is, is, is exclusive to a living process and can't be simply reduced to some electromagnetic uh, mathematical change. So anyway, so Becker started looking at this process and he found a couple of interesting things. One, that cells which had previously been specific, were, which were, say, blood cells or bone cells or something like that, would actually be, and this was, he was the first one to discover this, could actually be de-differentiated and then become something else. So that something which was, say, a blood cell could then be induced to transform back into an undifferentiated cell, sort of a generic cell, and then could become something else, like a skin cell or a bone cell or something. Which was interesting, because before that, no one thought that people started to understand, okay, you had a differentiation process, but no one thought that there was such thing as de-differentiation. He then set up a, another interesting experiment where they gave a salamander cancer. And they had to first generate it in a frog because apparently salamanders just don't develop cancer on their own, which would be something worth looking into. But they were able to yeah, induce cancer from a frog into the salamander. Now, what they did is they then amputated the salamander's leg, cut it right at a, a tumor point. So they basically cut a tumor in half. So here at the end, you had sort of the nub, and then it was, you had all this cancer cells there. What he discovered was that the cancer cells would then, were being de-differentiated out of cancer cells and then actually becoming healthy cells, becoming bone cells, skin cells, and whatnot. So the cancer was actually being transformed by the salamander, those cells, and then used as part of the development of its new limb to become healthy cells. Which, you know, again, it's like opens up a whole new range of possible, you know, cures and investigations for things like cancer. What he then was wondering, well, how could, he wanted to then reproduce this different, de-differentiation process in the laboratory. So he used, I think, blood cells. And he said initially he was very sort of anxious. He didn't know if he was going to be able to generate enough current to make this thing de-differentiate. But what he found is that he kept, having to, he, less, he kept lessening it and lessening it and lessening it because it would be destructive at a certain voltage to the point where he says once he got it down to what he called a near vanishing amount of voltage, that's what induced the de-differentiation. That this wasn't some sort of a blunt high energy process, but that actually higher energies either had no effect or a destructive effect. It was only at the point you had what he called a near vanishing amount of voltage you know, a nearly infinitesimal amount of voltage that you could then induce this de-differentiation. Which then sent him on this whole other path of saying, wow, these kinds of biological effects in relation to electromagnetic effects are happening at a very subtle, subtle, subtle weak force level. That these things are not, you know, your, what we typically think of as big, powerful forces which are doing this. But everything is happening at a very tuned and very low energy, low voltage kind of level. So he then went a little bit further in some of his investigations and started to say, well, okay, well, how does some of this work? 
I now get at one of a couple studies that sort of show that now actually start to get into some of the specifics of why we talk about the challenge of tuning the universe to the benefit of man. Because these things are never just simply one particular force or one particular type of electromagnetic activity. But in fact, it's the harmonics, it's the relationship among a bunch of different types of frequencies, which are then what are producing the effect. You, know, you can start to think of it as almost like a, a cosmic chorus of different frequencies, different voices, tuned in just the right kind of way, which are in fact what are producing these kinds of changes and transformations and effects. So just to mention um, a couple of, just mention two studies here that he did. Um, so what Becker, he started to liken this to the kind of process that you get in things like nuclear magnetic resonance phenomena. Or what he called, or the other thing, what he talked about is cyclotron resonance, which is that, I'll just show this image just so people get, this is just a, this is an image of the way that um, MRIs work, where basically you put the patient in a very strong magnetic field, and then you, then you hit it with pulses of radio frequency energy, and basically what produces the image is the way whenever it's hit with the radio frequency, it sort of changes the orientation of the hydrogen atoms, I think the hydrogen nucleus, and then it's the way that it sort of reorients back whenever the radio frequency is removed. The way it bounces back, the, the rate at which it bounces back, that's what sort of then is read and gives you the image that you get with the MRI image. And, you know, different things like cancer cells react differently than healthy cells to this kind of process. So that's how they're able to detect things like cancers based off of the relationship and then the reaction of the hydrogen to radio and the, the interaction of the radio and magnetic frequency. So, much like with Montagnier's work we were looking at, it's the interaction of two different types of fields, of electromagnetic fields, which are producing the effect. So what Becker started looking, he said, okay, we can liken this to another kind of thing, what he called cyclotron resonance, which was basically the idea that you have very low frequency um, background magnetic field, which is then being, so you have certain chemicals. Okay, one study was done by the the U.S. Naval Medical Research Center, which I guess is actually in Bethesda, Maryland. I don't know if they're still doing this stuff. But they wanted to look at, in particular, the effects of um, lithium release in rats. Now, lithium is significant because it has a certain kind of calming effect. It's actually given as a drug to people who have, um, what's it called, uh, the big mood swing one. Um, well, I think, yeah, schizophrenia and then, uh, yeah, bipolar. It's sort of whenever you're in the more manic state, it can be used to calm you down. Anyway, so they did this study of saying, okay, well, what, um, let's say we start to basically blast these rats with very low frequency uh, radiation, extremely low frequency radiation. And they're in particular using, I think, 60 hertz. And what they found was that Whenever they did this, you would get an increase in release of lithium in these rats. Now, they, there were other studies done where else they did with calcium, I think, using 16 hertz, and a number of different studies of this type, where they were looking at what effect did certain kinds of extremely low frequency have on certain chemical, biochemical changes in different you know, animals, different rats. I think they did some on people with calcium. But they started getting different, different results, that some places where it was done, you get some large amount of increase. Other studies that were done at other laboratories would be a little bit different, or maybe they get no increase. So what they finally concluded, as they went back and they said, okay, well, let's actually measure the change and the frequency used against what we know was the actual background geomagnetic field strength at particular locations. Now, the geomagnetic field of the Earth, it changes. It's varied all around the Earth. Different places have a higher and lesser, depending on where you are. And it generally ranges between about 0.2 and 0.6 Gauss, which is very, very low. I mean, it's an extremely uh, small amount of 
of, uh, of strength of the magnetic field. And so what they found was that there was a definite relationship between the field strength of the magnetic field and the frequency used of the extremely low frequency radiation. And depending on what combination of the two you had, that was actually what was determining whether or not you're going to get some change in lithium or calcium or other kinds of, um, of ion changes in, bi in the biological structure. And so it's from this that he started to think about, well, this is actually probably much more, at least along the lines, of the kind of mechanism involved in sort of biological changes that are induced as a function of electromagnetic activity. That is very much a relationship between very specific types of field strengths and frequencies which are creating the effects and not just one any particular type of frequency. And I'll show this little sort of chart that gets and makes the point on it. So you said a little, came up with this little schematic based off of the, the data that they were getting. So they came up with this for a bunch of different of these um, lithium, calcium, I think uh, sodium, and potassium. So basically what this is, this is the, this is the steady state background field measured in Gauss's. So 0 0.2, 0 0.6. So this would be different, sort of your background magnetic field, geomagnetic field of varying strength depending on the time of the day, the time of the year, what's going on with solar activity, where you are on Earth. And this would then be the oscillating field that was then induced. And so what they, basically then what this box shows is that for, say, example, this frequency here, this is the one they were using, which was, I think, 60 hertz, that for 60 hertz, you got the maximum effect of change on lithium ions at a 0.2 Gauss field strength. Now, if you went to a different field strength, that would require a different, you know, a lower, or a, yeah, different change in the, in the hertz. So they sort of set up this basic chart. The point being that depending on, it was an interaction of the specific strength of the, of the geomagnetic field, would then determine at what frequency you would get a certain effect on these different types of, of ions in the body. And so he then, so he came up with a very developed sort of mathematics that goes to sort of test this and sees what, what the effects are. But the point being, this is actually how the process works. It's a very highly tuned process. Now the other thing that he said, sort of the main point that came out of this, is that all of these effects when you're dealing with very small, very low intensity steady states, most effects occur in the extremely low frequency domain. That it's not the high frequency stuff, it's not x-rays or radio waves or anything like that. It's extremely low frequency radiation, you know, of the range like we saw with the Schumann resonances, interacting with very weak fields like the geomagnetic field. And that's the interaction of these two, which then tend to produce the maximum effect of this kind of ionic change. And so this leads to just all kinds of very interesting studies and ideas about, well, what kind of effects and changes are we then going to be producing as we start to engage in this kind of biospheric engineering process, as we start to possibly affect changes in the geomagnetic field through the effects of the NAWAPA and other programs. How we start to affect changes in current strength through the changing of the ocean currents and the effects that has on the electric current strength. What kind of changes are we going to produce as we say increase or decrease or change the electromagnetic Schumann resonances through changes in weather patterns, changes in thunderstorm patterns? One, so how are we going to change those things? Then two, as this becomes more refined, we can actually start to think about how we could intentionally start to tune the entire planet, start to tune the entire solar system and beyond to the benefit of human beings, both the biological benefit of human beings, but then ultimately 
and this gets back to the first imagery, the cognitive benefit of mankind. So I'll just give one last image which sort of brings a lot of this together in a very interesting way. And you remember we talked about the Crab Nebula. This is the time lapse of the Crab Nebula that shows the, the pulsar. You know, what's generally understood is that there's some sort of a pulsar star. We don't know exactly what that is, but what we know is that it's, it's generating something where it's every, it has a certain frequency of pulsing in which a flash of electromagnetic radiation is being pulsed in our direction at a certain frequency. And this sort of, the, this is based off of a, this image here is based off of a couple of slides they put together which sort of give you an idea of the pulsing of this thing where you're getting a certain expansion and pulsing. This is in the, I think this is x-ray and this is supposed to be visual but it's, it's funny how they got this. Now here's the interesting thing. The pulse rate of the Crab Nebula is in the frequency which we attribute to these kind of effects. The Crab Nebula has a pulse rate of 30 hertz, which means that every second it's sort of flashing us at 30 hertz, which raises all kinds of questions about exactly what is the total connectedness of life and processes here on Earth to a much larger galactic phenomena. That in fact, many of the, it's not just here on Earth with the Schumann resonances, but it's also on a galactic scale that you've got all kinds of extremely low frequency interactions between our geomagnetic field and possibly the activity of such things as the Crab Nebula. Which then raises all kinds of questions about what really is sort of behind the organizing principle of life here on Earth as life here on Earth is connected to a global process of, of development and, and cosmic radiation. And that's exactly the domain that we're pushing on right now in our research in you know, what we call the basement, which is that there's a whole spectrum of investigation which has to be opened up. If, one, we're going to come to resolve many of these problems such as cancer, and other biological problems. And two, probably more fundamentally, if we're going to figure out how we're going to so start to support human life off of Earth. You think about the problem of going to Mars. Well, number one, Mars doesn't have a, ge a magnetic field. It has sort of little, sort of has some magnetic activity around it, but it doesn't have a steady state magnetic field. We've seen how important that may be to life on Earth. It doesn't have the same size as the Earth, which means to the extent that you could have the atmosphere that produced a Schumann type resonance, the frequencies would be different because the frequency is based off of the size of the planet. So you'd have a very different kind of Schumann resonance characteristic on Mars. Mars also doesn't have the atmosphere that we have, so you have a whole different quality of relationship to cosmic radiation and the like. It also has a different magnetic field, I mean a different gravitational field. So we start to take all these things into effect, the magnetic field, the gravitational field, the Schumann resonances, the cosmic radiation, all of these things which go into a certain kind of harmony and interaction necessary for the sustaining of life on Earth. How do you actually overcome the challenge of the lack of those particular qualities of tuning on another planet? or off of our own planet. That becomes the next real challenge for mankind. And the, we're gonna, the breakthroughs in realizing how to overcome that challenge are to a large extent going to come through what we discover about the changes that we create here by initially things like Nawapa and the Eurasian Land Bridge. So not only are the Nawapa project and the Eurasian Land Bridge necessary for our immediate recovery now out of this economic collapse. But they're also necessary because it's through the kind of changes that we create with those projects that we're going to gain a greater, greater insight into what is necessary for life 
and what's going to be required to support and sustain human civilization off of the planet and deeper and deeper into the cosmos. So that's the future that we potentially have before us, that kind of investigation, that kind of vision. But, of course, it does all start with the first thing, which is we've got to get Obama out of office <laughs> or else you know, the only thing that's going to be resonating are the, the gas ovens that the guy intends to set up. So I'm going to end with that and take any questions.